Welcome to the Future of Resolution, Miles Mediation and Arbitration's podcast. In this episode of the Future of Resolution, Miles Neutral Stephen McKinney sits down with Shelby Gilbert to discuss the proposed Georgia Uniform Mediation Act and its strategic impact on international dispute resolution in Atlanta. Shelby is a partner with King & Spaulding, where he specializes in commercial litigation and domestic and international arbitration. Shelby, we very much appreciate your taking the time to uh, be with us today and uh, to discuss not only your practice, but to discuss that part of your practice that's come to relate to uh, the proposed Uniform Mediation Act here in Georgia. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you today about that proposal. We're very excited about it. Good. Shelby, to start with, can you give us a, uh, a background on your experience and your practice here in Atlanta? Sure. Uh, I'm a partner in the trial and global disputes practice at King & Spaulding. And for those of you who don't know, King & Spaulding is a global law firm. It was started in Atlanta back in 1885, so one of the oldest law firms in town. But we're now a global law firm, and we've got over 20 offices around the world today. And I've been here for almost 15 years, always within the litigation group. Before I started here, I clerked for Judge Ed Carnes, who's now the chief judge on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. So that's uh, my practice. Great. What kind of matters do you typically handle, Shelby? Most of my matters involve uh, complex commercial disputes. And I have today a a heavy focus on insurance recovery disputes, uh, where our firm is representing our corporate clients in disputes with their insurance companies. Uh, A large part of my practice also involves cross-border disputes, where you have two companies that have a dispute about a contract. One of those parties might be located in Asia. The other party is located in Georgia. We might represent the foreign party half the time. Sometimes it's the party in the United States. And you have to figure out where are you going to resolve that dispute and what law controls. And that's been one of the more fascinating aspects of my practice uh, since I've joined the firm. Shelby, what portion of your practice uh, intersects alternative dispute resolution? Well, I'd say almost 100% of the practice today. While we like to think of ourselves here as trial lawyers and uh, lawyers who take matters to arbitration hearings and resolve disputes that way, I I think most of our disputes actually resolve through some sort of ADR process, whether that's uh, arbitration or increasingly mediation. I think you've probably seen the statistics that for most commercial disputes, most of them don't go to jury trial, fewer than uh, 90, uh, I think fewer than 1% of cases that are filed in the federal courts today actually resolve through a jury trial. So, and the reason for that is that our clients and I think parties on the other side realize that mediation is often a cost-effective way to resolve a dispute, remove some of the risk that you face if you go to the jury, and, and it's faster. It works for both sides. What, what part of the, your practice involves arbitration? What portion? It it varies from year to year. Uh, Some years it's more than 50% of the disputes that I'm handling will be resolved through an arbitration. Other years it's less. It it depends a lot of times on whether the dispute when it comes to us is based on a contract that has an arbitration agreement. And it already that says, well, in the event of any disputes, you're going to arbitrate and this is how you're going to do it. Sometimes we'll have a dispute where we can't figure out how to resolve it. It looks like you're going to have to go to court if you want to, and we'll just call up the other side on the telephone and say, hey, would you rather arbitrate this? There may be some advantages. Let's think about that before we go down the road of filing a complaint and doing our discovery. Maybe there's a more efficient way to do that. So that's something we always take a look at at the beginning of a new engagement for our clients. Shelby, have you found in your practice that alternative dispute resolution is a peculiarly uh, American process? I don't think it's peculiarly American. I think that there are types of ADR processes that are familiar around the globe, and it's really always been that way. If you look back through history, there's evidence of people finding ways to resolve disputes. If you go back to ancient times, to Greece and Rome, and look at other parts of the world and and, and China, there's evidence of China and India of 
arbitrators resolving disputes where you have people from different cultures on trading routes that, that need to find a way to resolve a dispute, you find somebody that both sides trust and they end up adjudicating the dispute. Now, it's not like we have today where you have arbitral institutions that have a whole bunch of rules that will specify how you conduct the hearing, how you appoint the arbitrators, but it's similar to the the way where both parties agree, but we're not going to go to the court in this location or in the, your home court. We're going to resolve it through uh, arbitrator or, or alternatively we'll have a mediator who will, will help facilitate a resolution. So I think you, you, parties are familiar with it. I think there's a distinct American way of doing things that, uh, and a lot of people talk about the growing Americanization of arbitration and mediation around the world. And there's been some backlash to that in parts of the world. But I think the idea of resolving a dispute outside the court system is not something that's new. Characterize for me, if you could, uh, in your terms, what, what the Americanization of alternative dispute resolution uh, has looked like or is perceived to be in other parts of the world. Well, you see that the most in international arbitration. So international arbitration is arbitration, but it's international in that one party is from another country. That's what makes it international. And you have to find a way to, if the arbitration results in an award, where are you going to enforce that? So there are all these procedural mechanisms and treaties that define how that works and, and ensures that the process will be successful and that the awards that are issued will be enforceable. Uh, and historically, one of the advantages of international arbitration or perceived advantages has been that it's faster and that it's cheaper. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, if you do an international arbitration in a civil law jurisdiction or in uh, the United Kingdom, there's less use uh, in those court systems of discovery mechanisms. They're, uh, particularly in a civil law country, uh, lawyers over there don't know what to do with a document request that says, give me any and all documents that relate to X, Y, and Z. That's just not the way they resolve disputes in the court systems there. I think as Americans have gotten more involved in international arbitration, they've brought in more of those U.S. style document requests. And uh, you see that in the IBA rules on the taking of evidence now, there is increasingly, there, there are ways that it's supposed to be, this is the way the international arbitration will be conducted, and it brought in ways that people can seek documents from the other side. Uh, what we have seen in the last couple of years is a reaction to that uh, called the, the Prague rules on the taking of evidence, which were uh, promulgated primarily by those in civil law countries and in Russia, where they say, well, we don't want to have lots of fights and arbitration about document issues. That misses the whole point of having an efficient, streamlined process that will save everybody money. So th I think that's part of the backlash that we're seeing today. It'll be interesting to see which of those rules will will become more predominant, and maybe the idea is that parties can choose, and maybe that's a good thing, that there are different ways that you can resolve disputes. Shelby, are there a significant number of firms and attorneys in Atlanta who are engaged in uh, international dispute resolution? Well, there are more than you would think that, that are involved. That there, Of course, some of the larger firms in Atlanta that have dedicated international arbitration practice groups. So King and Spalding's one, and there are probably 10 other law firms that, that have large practice groups. But there are other firms that have uh, attorneys that do mainly trial work, but from time to time find themselves with an international dispute or a cross-border dispute, and they find themselves engaged in this as well. You see this with uh, construction law firms or law firms that specialize in insurance disputes representing insurance companies. Occasionally those go to arbitration. And I think that with the growth in international commerce, we're going to see more and more of that in Georgia, more of the smaller and mid-sized law firms are going to have this experience. We also see this in other parts of Georgia. So it's not just an Atlanta phenomenon that all of the international dispute resolution uh, 
that's taking place here. We've got a, a giant port and a lot of trade that comes through Savannah, and we're seeing more of this type of activity down there because the lawyers there are working on contracts that have arbitration agreements. Shelby, what, what are the considerations that uh, parties either here in the States or overseas take into consideration when deciding wh where to seat or where to venue a particular dispute resolution process? Well, the first thing that a party has to consider that we always consider is want to make sure that whichever venue has been proposed is a party to the New York Convention on the Enforcement of Arbitral Awards. Because the last thing you want to do is arbitrate your case, you spend a year in arbitration, you get the final award, but then you can't enforce it against the other party if you win. And, and uh, most countries today are now parties to the New York Convention, but that's something we always look at first. I think uh, uh, other types of things that you look at are convenience is, is important. You want to pick a location where everybody can get on a plane and get to easily. You want to have a venue where uh, everybody speaks the language. One, one issue that comes up in, in international disputes is you, you got to agree what language you're going to conduct the arbitration in. And if that means you need interpreters in the arbitration, you need to have facilities available where you can bring those interpreters in. Uh, another issue is that you want to have a location where there are qualified arbitrators that can handle that type of uh, particularly uh, complex international dispute. You want people that are, that are, are well-known quantities, if, if possible. And you also want arbitrators that would be familiar, if possible, with the governing law of the contract. So you may be wary of arbitrating a dispute, let's say, in Asia, if the contract is governed by the French law. So those are things that you need to think about. Sometimes that works if you've got a different venue from the, the choice of law, but those are issues that you need to consider on the front end. Gotcha. Shelby, how does that uh, calculus change when you move from arbitration to making decisions about uh, possible mediation? Well, I, I think that the considerations are similar, but mediation usually is a one or two day event, and maybe have some follow up consultations. And the other issue in mediation is that it, at least the cases that I handle are typically, uh, it's a voluntary process. So it, if the mediation doesn't result in a, a settlement, then both sides can walk away. And you don't have the issue, at least right now, or this may change in the future, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later, but a mediated settlement is not something that you would take typically to a court and try to enforce. So you wouldn't need the infrastructure of the New York Convention to enforce that mediated settlement. Uh, so I think it's slightly different. The, the, the issues that tend to come up with our clients when we're thinking about, well, where do we mediate? I think international clients are concerned about U.S. discovery. And one of the most important things in the mediation to make the process work is that both sides need to be upfront with the mediator and, and to admit weaknesses in their case. That's part of why you mediate, and that's how you can achieve a successful resolution. What our international clients sometimes ask us is, well, how can we be assured that if we admit um, weaknesses in our case to a mediator or in a mediation statement in the United States that those statements won't be used against us in some other proceeding, whether it's in this particular case that we're trying to resolve or in some future case, because you've got these crazy discovery rules in the United States. So we have to assure our clients that you can protect that. And we try to do that through comp mediation confidentiality agreements is one thing, but Clients like to be, be assured that there will also be code provisions or things like that that will give them, a, a, particularly clients from civil law countries. Well, following on that, Shelby, tell me a little bit about the Georgia Supreme Court's Commission on Dispute Resolution. Sure. So the Georgia Commission on Dispute Resolution uh, started a, a little bit over 20 years ago. I think it's actually the work initially started in the early 1990s and they promulgated a set of rules to promote mediation uh, of court connected disputes. So this, the, the commission has jurisdiction and promotes rules for 
what, what, what I call court-connected mediations, where a judge says, you need to mediate the dispute, and there are a set of mediators that are tied to the court system who are registered with the commission who can mediate disputes. And since that commission got going, I think that about 200,000 cases have successfully been mediated pursuant to the, the rules for mediation in Georgia that the commission has set up. And you can go to the Georgia Supreme Court's website and read what those rules are. All right. uh, and Shelby, how about the Atlanta International Arbitration Society? So Atlanta International Arbitration Society is a, a little bit different. Uh, what the, the Arbitration Society, we call it ATLAS, uh, it, for short, it's a group that started back in 2010, and you asked me about the law firms in the state that are engaged in this activity. What we started to realize is that we have a lot of firms that are doing international dispute resolution, but we're getting on airplanes and we're doing the arbitration in London or in France or elsewhere around the world, and while it's great to get on a plane and, and go to, to Paris to resolve a dispute. It's, it can be expensive, and it's a long plane ride. And we started to think, well, why are we going halfway across the world to handle these disputes when we could do them in Atlanta? Atlanta's got a great airport, and, and wouldn't it be great for the local bar if there was more international dispute resolution activity taking place in Atlanta? It seemed like a no-brainer to us. So we got a group of, of law firms. We got uh, some academics that have been involved in dispute resolution from all the law, law schools in the state. We got some members of the judiciary to participate and we formed an organization. And the mission of Atlas is to promote Atlanta as a venue for international dispute resolution. And that's what we've been up to for the last nine years. Great. Shelby, tell me a little bit about the working group that was formed between the uh, Supreme Court Commission and uh, the Atlanta International Arbitration Society. Sure. Well, Atlas in about 2013, uh, uh, Atlas from its beginning actually has been very active in promoting legislation that would facilitate and promote the use of, of international dispute resolution in the state of Georgia. And one of the first things that we looked at was the, the International Arbitration Code in Georgia. And we thought that it would send a strong signal to the international community if we updated our code. We had a code that I think the first one was passed in 1985. It was outdated and we needed to do some work. So that was one of the first legislative uh, actions that we took. So we worked with a number of professors, uh, at Doug Yarn in particular at Georgia State Law School and others to rewrite the code. And that was signed into law by Governor Deal, I think back in 2013, 2014. After we did that, we started looking at other things that we could do to solidify Georgia's place as a leader in the international dispute resolution. And one of the things we looked at was mediation because while Atlas is primarily an organization dedicated to promoting international arbitration, I think most of us realize that we might do the arbitration, the dispute ultimately resolves through a mediation half the time. So what can we do to promote more mediation? Because a lot of us do arbitration, we do mediation, and there's a symbiotic relationship between both. So is there legislation that we need in Georgia for international mediations? So our legislative committee took a look at this, and some of us had had experiences with international clients who had concerns about whether there's a privilege or not when they mediate in Georgia. And what we decided to do initially was to look at adopting in Georgia the UNCTRAL model law on international conciliation. So the UNCTRAL is a group, the United Nations International Trade Group that promotes laws around the world for use in alternative dispute resolution. They have the, the UNCTRAL model law on international commercial arbitration, but then they've also they've got their rules and they've done a lot of work in the mediation field. And we thought, well, maybe we should enact a narrow provision that would make that applicable to all international mediations in the state of Georgia. Wouldn't affect domestic uh, mediations, it would just be international mediations. 
So we were thinking about proposing that to the legislature. And as we started talking through the issue, so many of us had or also do domestic mediations. And we also realized that there's this great act out there called the Uniform Mediation Act, which incorporates the UNCTRAL law on international conciliation, but it also fixes some other things that we thought, well, maybe we can make some improvements in the state of Georgia. And one of those uh, important ones is that you mentioned earlier the Georgia Commission on Dispute Resolution Commission, which they, they, they've done a great job promoting and creating clear rules for use in court-connected mediations. But those rules don't apply to voluntary mediations, which a lot of our clients use. So not uh, right now, if the judge tells you to mediate through the court-connected process, there's a set of rules. But if you mediate with a private mediator, that's more like the Wild West. And uh, we thought, well, that's an important gap that maybe we could fix. And we also thought that if we're going to create a privilege for international mediations, that that might create some problems with domestic mediation. So why have a privilege for international mediations if there's no privilege for Georgia uh, domestic mediations? That could create some problems. So that's why we started looking at the Uniform Mediation Act. And what we realized is if we were going to take that step, there are a lot of stakeholders in the state that are involved in this space that we needed to bring into the tent to make sure that this was really the right law and the right thing to do in Georgia. So that's why we formed the working group. We reached out to the Georgia Commission, talked to Judge Auslander, who was the former chair of that commission, who's still involved with our effort, and said, well, we're thinking about promoting the, and the Uniform Mediation Act in Georgia. Is this something that you could get behind? And I think the initial reaction was, well, yes, this would solve a lot of problems. We like our rules, but if we have a code, that's going to make our life on the commission a whole lot easier. And it looks like everything that's in the Uniform Mediation Act is lines up with what the commission has been trying to accomplish over the last 20 years. The thing that it, we, don't, we don't have is a mediation privilege in Georgia. We don't have that, but virtually everything else was familiar to the commission. So we, what we decided to do was to form a working group that would really dive into the issue and figure out, well, are there conflicts or would we create problems if we had have the Uniform Mediation Act? Would that negate some of the protections that George already has in the, the Georgia Commission rules? And the answer to that after about the year and a half of work was, no, we should move forward with the Uniform Mediation Act. Shelby, when the working group um, <clears throat> started its work, were there particular areas that it determined that it was going to focus on initially? Yes, there were. And maybe I'll talk a little bit about who was on the working group because we wanted to make sure that we had representatives from around the state looking at this from different parts of the mediation community. So we had the support and participation of, of the commission. So we had several commissioners participate in our meetings. Uh, the Georgia Commission on Dispute Resolution isn't just a group of lawyers who do mediation, and they promulgate rules for uh, for non-lawyer mediations, where you have a uh, the mediation, nobody in the room's a lawyer. And we thought it was important to include representatives from the non-lawyer mediation community in the state. We also brought in some academics, and we brought in some folks to, at some of the law firms around town that do a lot of mediation. We also brought in mediators from some of the larger mediation institutions in, in town. So we had representatives from JAMS, uh, who they've looked at this Uniform Mediation Act in other states. Uh, uh, I guess the, the JAMS representative we had was the former chair of the ABA section on dispute resolution, Wayne Thorpe. We also had some leading mediators who are not involved with institutions, but are just mediators who do this type of thing on the side, retired practitioners, but mediate a lot of cases because we wanted their perspective as well. So we assembled this group, and there are about a dozen of us, and we looked at the act in our first meeting, and we looked at the rules, and we said, well, the for first thing we want to do is to do no harm to what we've got in Georgia. So we needed to figure out, are there any... Is there anything in the Uniform Mediation Act that conflicts with what is in the Georgia rules? 
So that was the first thing we looked at. We identified about five or six areas where what was in the Uniform Mediation Act was different or went beyond what was in the commission rules. And we identified those areas. And those areas were mediation privilege, which is the main innovation of the Uniform Mediation Act. We looked at disclosure requirements, which was also important, and that's new in the Uniform Mediation Act. We looked at the international component in, in the Uniform Mediation Act, which also was not something that's in the uh, existing rules. And those were the three issues. Now, we looked at other issues that, in the details and the drafting on issues relating to confidentiality, on exceptions to the privilege, exceptions to confidentiality. Right. But it was after we identified those issues, we had a series of meetings for the next year and a half where before each meeting, a member of the working group was assigned the task of researching the issue, looking at what states and other countries in certain circumstances had done with respect to these very same issues. We looked at whether the Uniform Mediation Act had resulted in litigation or problems since, it, uh, since a number of states have adopted it uh, over the last 15 years. So we want to see, well, is this not the way to go? and drafted research memos, and then we would meet for an hour and a half and, and talk through the issues, and then come up with a recommendation on each of those issues on how we wanted to move forward, and that was our process. Shelby, let me, uh, let me ask you if, if we could sort of drill down just a little bit on each of the three areas that the working group used as a starting place for its work. The first of those you mentioned was confidentiality and evidentiary privilege. Can you talk about uh, that part of the working group's work? Sure. Well, as I mentioned, the main innovation of the Uniform Mediation Act is that it creates a privilege for communications in a mediation. And that privilege is a privilege that belongs to the, the parties to the mediation and also is a privilege that belongs to the mediator. And the Uniform Mediation Act in Section 6 creates a number of exceptions to that privilege. For example, uh, misconduct of the mediator or similar to the crime fraud exception that many people are familiar with. If uh, there's a, a mediation communication that reflects an intent to commit a bodily injury or to commit a fraud, there are a series of exceptions in that act. And we looked at that and then we looked at the rules that the commission has and we realized that there, there is no privilege in the commission rules. Uh, I think that that surprises a lot of people because they, most people think, well, if I'm in a mediation, everything I say is going to be confidential. It's never going to be used against me. And that's just not the case in Georgia today. Well, um, it, it seems that one of the features of this particular issue um, is that in Georgia, like in most states or anywhere in the world where you might do mediation, there's an, oftentimes an effort on the part of the parties in entering into a mediation agreement to enter into a contractual agreement about uh, the confidential character of the communications and setting rules by way of agreement between the parties um, uh, for the mediation. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, the, um, uh, the advantages of having a legislative um, uh, feature relating to those kinds of issues in mediation as opposed to one that's simply uh, governed by contract between the parties? Sure, and this is something that we discussed when we were uh, having our meetings with the, the, the bar when we were trying to push this through uh, and get the bar's approval. That was a, a comment that we got from some people who said, well, we don't really need this because everybody addresses this issue in, through a contract. And really, I think there are two responses to that. I think that the First is to remember that the, that may be true for lawyers involved or for mediations involving sophisticated lawyers re representing sophisticated clients who are paying for the law firm like a King and Spalding to represent their interest in the mediation. For sure, there is an opportunity and expectation that you will find a way to enter into a mediation contract that protects your interest and protects confidentiality the best you can. But there are thousands of mediations that take place in this state every year where you don't have sophisticated parties. You don't have lawyers that are asking their clients to think about confidentiality before they go into a mediation. So 
I think that that's one reason a lot of people don't think about, well, but there are mediations that don't involve lawyers in this state, and the code will protect everybody to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. I think that the second issue is that a it's great to have an agreement that says this is these are the rules and this is what we're going to follow but then you have to find out where to enforce that agreement and it's also not a privilege it's it's privilege and confidentiality are different concepts so uh, that's another reason why this uh, agreement that's a, that's a great uh, prophylactic measure to protect your communications and we always recommend you do that to our clients but it's not the same thing as a privilege right uh, take just a moment and uh, characterize for us, if you could, the distinction between privilege and confidentiality and how that feature of mediation has significance. Well, in confidentiality, there, there's a rule in, in Georgia, and it's, it's similar to Rule 408, the Rules of Evidence, and now it's embodied in Section 408 of the Georgia Evidence Code that a settlement communication, including a communication in a mediation, generally is not admissible. Now, that's a rule of admissibility. An evidentiary law. And it's a rule, a rule of evidentiary law. Uh, what that doesn't do is it doesn't protect the statement in the mediation from being discovered. And there's a big distinction between rules governing admissibility and rules governing discoverability. And I think that the concern of the international parties coming into Georgia and looking at this is, well, that's great. It, it, I, what I say, if, if the, the judge says that's not admissible in this proceeding, then, then that's good. That, I like that protection. That gives me some confidence. But what I'm concerned about is the next plaintiff lawyer that comes in or the next uh, com my competitor who comes in and wants to see what I said in this mediation. And they send a subpoena in some other case. And I understand that the rule in the United States is that uh, discoverability is anything that is possibly relevant to the case is discoverable, then that doesn't give me a whole lot of comfort. So that's why people want the privilege. And it could cause international parties to be reluctant to do mediation, for instance, in Atlanta, as opposed to doing it overseas. Exactly. Or in another state in the United States where the privilege is recognized. All right. Shelby, help me drill down uh, just for a minute on uh, a second uh, starting place for the working group, which was, uh, as you described it, mediator disclosure requirements. That was an area of where we had to do some, some hard thinking because the, the commission has some rules on disclosure requirements. And I, I think that the voluntary mediations in the state, there are no rules, as I mentioned earlier. So if you're a mediator that is not registered with the Georgia Commission and you're holding yourself out to do a mediation where parties just want to hire you to see if you can resolve the dispute, they don't have to, uh, the mediator doesn't have to disclose prior representations or how many times he or she may have mediated a case with your law firm or for a particular client. And that creates some issues with parties coming in from outside the state of Georgia if they don't have the, the same information about a mediator, mediator's potential uh, conflicts of interest. Now, with, again, with a sophisticated law firm, we do our due diligence on every mediator, and, and we have a pretty good idea of, of who that mediator's represented and who his friends are, or whether she's got conflicts of interest. That's work that we do, but again, that doesn't always happen. And international clients always are still coming into a new jurisdiction where they're not comfortable may have those types of questions. So we thought that the better practice and consistent with what the, the folks at the Uniform Law Commission were doing, thought, we thought that just getting all conflicts of interest on the table in all mediations is the best way to ensure that everybody perceives that the process was fair. So that's why we promoted it. Now, the issue that we had to deal with in Georgia is that for a lot of the mediators who are affiliated with uh, mediation institutions, like a Jams or a Henning or a Miles, they, they have people who can handle this for them. There are secretaries and assistants in their offices who keep track of prior engagements, so it's very easy for them to come up with a list. But uh, 
If you're a solo practitioner in other parts of Georgia, it's a little bit trickier sometimes to keep track of all those engagements. But after talking with some of those stakeholders throughout the process, I think that they begrudgingly agreed that that is something that is the better practice to track these prior engagements and make sure that everybody's got that information if they want it before the mediation. So we talked about the pros and cons so that may create some problems for some mediators in Georgia and create another layer of, of paperwork. But for the process and to ensure that a fair process in Georgia and to send the right signal to folks around the world, we thought that that was the right way to go. Shelby, is it possible for you to help us with what I would call a high line summary of uh, what's been proposed to the legislature in Georgia as the Uniform Mediation Act? Yeah, so the proposal is to adopt the Uniform Mediation Act, generally as set forth on, on, the, on the, the Uniform Law Commission's website. We've made very few changes. We've made a few changes to some cross sections of the agreement to where it was needed to address certain Georgia law specific issues. But by and large, we didn't make a lot of changes. And uh, the reason for that is that we want a law that's uniform. I mean, you lose the benefit of a uniform law if you make a whole lot of changes to it. So. We didn't make a whole lot of changes except where necessary to protect the unique issues under Georgia law or to have the right cross-reference to certain code provisions. Uh, the other thing that we did uh, is that we, since the Uniform Mediation Act was last updated in 2003, that act incorporates, as I mentioned earlier, the uniform, the, the UNCITRAL model law on international conciliation. That law was recently updated by the UNCITRAL last year and through the, what's called the Singapore Convention. And that what the new Singapore Convention on International Mediation does is that it allows parties to a mediation to agree, if they want to, that their mediation will have the same force as a award under the New York Convention as an arbitral award under the New York Convention. That is to say, any resolution to a dispute that comes out of such a mediation would be, that, that is the agreement that resolves the dispute would be enforceable under the New York Convention. That's right. And Georgia, if this is, if Georgia enacts the, the, the code next year, would be the first state in the United States to do that, which we think would send a very strong signal to practitioners around the world that we're on the leading edge of international dispute resolution. You know, everything we have said thus far, Shelby, about the Uniform Mediation Act that's being proposed in Georgia uh, certainly lends to uh, uh, a, a sense that anyone looking to be engaged in mediation in Georgia would find in the act uh, some larger measure of certainty uh, in terms of what they can expect out of the process. Are there any provisions in the Uniform Mediation Act that specifically address privacy concerns? Well, there are specific concerns. Uh, th th there's a separate section for confidentiality. So uh, section three of the act, I believe, is the confidentiality section. And everything in the mediation is supposed to be confidential. Uh, four through six are unprivileged. I, I don't think that there's a section that deals with privacy if you're talking about private information right. and, and those types of issues. Right. How about exceptions to applicability? So it, there are exceptions to applicability, and I, I think that in the Uniform Mediation Act, if parties want to, they can opt out of the mediation privilege, sections four through six of the act. And there are circum circumstances where parties that are mediating a dispute that may be uh, highly public in nature may want for certain reasons to opt out of those protections, but to do so, they have to opt out through a writing. That's the main exception because I think when the act was being promulgated, people realized there may be certain disputes where parties may want the proceedings of the mediation to be public in nature. Uh, how many other states in the United States have adopted the Uniform Mediation Act? Right now, the last I looked, there are 12 states that have adopted it, and it is currently in the legislature in Massachusetts and I believe New York, and it's in various stages of the drafting process with 
various bar associations around the country. In addition to that, I think a lot of states, probably about 24 states, may not have the Uniform Mediation Act, but they at least have some form of a mediation privilege, whether that is recognized through a code provision or from a decision of the the state Supreme Court differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But you look at, for example, Florida, they haven't adopted the Uniform Mediation Act, but there is a recognized mediation privilege. There's not one in Georgia. Shelby, where where do things stand uh, at the Georgia legislature with respect to the proposed Uniform Mediation Act? Well, we've got a lot of momentum behind us going into the next legis- legislative session. As I mentioned, we had the working group and we spent about a year and a half working on the project and decided that we did want to move forward. So our next step was to take that proposal for a vote before the Georgia Dispute Resolution Commission, and it was unanimously approved. The next step was we wanted to make sure that the judiciary in Georgia was behind this since it would be a change. And we think that this is a good way to resolve disputes. Uh, and it takes a little bit of work off the, 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 the court system. And not surprisingly, the Judicial Commission also approved the legislation. So once we had the support of the commission and the Judicial Council, Then it was time to go through the bar process. So the dispute resolution section of the Georgia Bar has sponsored the legislation through the bar process. And we went to a lot of different committees, including the Trial and General Practice Committee, the Family Law Section Committee, the International Trade and Legal Services Committee, and several others to make sure there were no objections to the act. And then the next step was to get it through the the bar approval process. And in January, the Georgia Board of Governors at their mid-year meeting approved the legislation as part of the bar's legislative package. We got the legislation to the legislature, I think, a little late, right at the time when they were starting their session, and I think they've only got 45 days to consider everything. So we got it down to them. We got a little bit of work to do to find a sponsor for the bill, but so far the feedback has been good, and we're going to do a a couple more outreaches to them over the summer while they're not in session to make sure we've addressed all their concerns and questions that they may have, and then Hopefully, this will be, uh, and there we'll have a sponsor in January. Um, separately, we've talked about the, this legislation with the local chambers, and uh, there's a lot of support in the business community for this particular legislation because, again, it's, it gives parties more certainty and a way to resolve disputes outside the courtroom efficiently. Mm-hmm. So, we, Metro Atlanta Chamber and the Georgia Chamber of Commerce are behind the legislation as well. Have there been specific concerns raised in the legislature about the proposed Uniform Mediation Act? No specific concerns have have been raised to date. I think that the issue that we're going to have to deal with, I think, with with some of the the legislators is similar to what we had to deal when our working group first got started, which was the initial reaction to this is, well, why do you need a mediation privilege? Everything is privileged in mediation. And I think we just need to explain, no, we actually do have a problem in Georgia. We don't have a mediation privilege. And we've got two systems. We've got a set of rules that applies for court-connected mediations. And then we have no rules that apply to voluntary mediations. And that creates a lot of uncertainty in the courts. And uh, the Georgia Supreme Court has had to wrestle with that issue before where there's no code. And they've had to look to other laws from other states to try to fill the gap, and hopefully the legislation will help fill the gap for the courts. Shelby, what do you judge the impact would be of the passage of the Uniform Mediation Act on mediation in Georgia, and particularly in regard to uh, hosting international mediation? Well, I, th- I think that it's it's part and parcel, at least of the, the ATLAS goal of promoting a- Atlanta as a place where parties can feel comfortable resolving their disputes. And we're starting to see some empirical evidence that since we got our initiative going about nine years ago, that more folks are coming to Atlanta to resolve their disputes. And one of our early initiatives was to find a, or to to create an international arbitration facility in Georgia. And, And now we've got one downtown at the Georgia State Law School. And I think that they built that about 
opened maybe three or four years ago. Last year, they had over 150 hearing days, and hearing day meaning arbitration or mediation. So they're almost booked almost year round with that number of days. So that shows that people are starting to come in, the word's starting to get out uh, that Atlanta is a good place to resolve these disputes, and it only makes sense. I mean, Atlanta uh, has the world's best airport. It's a, a cheaper place to for hotel rooms than going to New York or to London or to Paris or to Singapore to resolve a dispute. We've got a great judicial infrastructure here. We have courts that are largely supportive of international arbitration and of mediation. They think it's a good idea, and you're not going to have a court or a judge derail the process like you may have to deal with in other jurisdictions. So I think the Atlanta story is starting to get out there, uh, and I think that passing this legislation will help solidify our our leadership uh, role in this area. How do you rate Atlanta um, right now in terms of how it's viewed by international parties uh, as a place for uh, both litigated and uh, non-litigated disputes? Well, when it comes to arbitration, I, I rate it near the top, at least in the United States. And the reason for that is that the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the federal court, the regional court that has jurisdiction over federal cases in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, is probably the most pro-arbitration court that you can find in the United States. And I think that's a key advantage that we have over other cities in the United States. So that's one thing that, that sets Atlanta apart. And I, I also think that I, I go back to the cost and convenience factors. Those are also uh, strong factors in Atlanta's favor. And I also think that there is a strong uh, group of, of practitioners in Atlanta that do this type of work. And I think that's also something that uh, it's really put Atlanta on the map. Now, are we in the same place that London and Paris are? No, we're not quite there yet, but we're punching above our weight and doing great things here. All right. Shelby, you and I have talked before uh, about our individual uh, practices um, and noted that there is or has been uh, across the years a uh, certain dispute resolution culture that has uh, developed in certain areas, particularly uh, just to pick one, reinsurance. You know, reinsurance disputes conventionally are, are often held in London, uh, maybe Bermuda, Chicago, um, but that there actually isn't any particular reason why those disputes couldn't be resolved in other venues, uh, just depending on the competence that the parties might have and the sophistication of the advocates and the other practical considerations you've talked about with respect to uh, the venue. Um, do you feel like there are other areas of the law uh, where international parties are involved where their confidence could be uh, improved and a, a sense could be generated that uh, just because the, the habit has been to do certain kinds of dispute resolution in London or Paris or Chicago, that those same disputes could be resolved in Atlanta? Absolutely. And I think we're working on that uh, with Atlas. And also, I think the chamber has been working on that in a different way. And, and Atlanta now has several unique industry clusters that are forming in, in Atlanta and in the southeastern region writ large. Uh, one of those uh, is the, the payment processing industry, which uh, it, where Atlanta is probably the leader in the United States for that particular industry. And one thing that we're looking at is can we find ways to give those companies comfort that those their disputes, when they resolve them in arbitration, should be resolved in Atlanta. And I know that the, the the legislature and the chamber are looking at ways to help those companies to make sure that the legal system is set up in a way that the substantive laws help their activity. We're looking at more from a procedural perspective. What can we do to get them confident to put Atlanta as the venue for arbitration and their arbitration agreements? Uh, you mentioned insurance. That's another example. Uh, and you're right that uh, historically those disputes have been resolved in London. I think that's because of the way Lloyd's got set up in right. 1600s at a coffee shop. And it's just been the way things have been done for the last 400 years. But you see a lot of policyholders who would prefer not to arbitrate their disputes in London. And there's their perception that 
that is sometimes not a fair location for policyholders just because a lot of the insurance companies give repeat business to the arbitrators. Whether that's fair or not is uh, something we could uh, debate for another day, but that's another way that I think uh, people are looking at, well, do I really want to resolve that type of dispute sure. there or could I bring it somewhere else? And the insurance companies, I think, are getting more comfortable with arbitrating in Atlanta. I think Atlanta, if you look at the laws that are on the books, the laws are fairly favorable to insurance companies and the state of Georgia, and we've got this huge cluster of, of insurance companies up by the perimeter where the, they're housing all of their claims managers and back office functions. So if they're deciding whether a claim is going to be paid, and you've got folks doing that in Atlanta, uh, why not, if, if there's litigation or arbitration arising out of that, resolve the dispute just 20 miles down the road in downtown Atlanta? Right. Shelby, uh, one of the things that I encounter as a neutral in uh, giving presentations to and hearing from uh, particularly uh, corporations um, uh, who are hopeful of using alternative dispute resolution to their advantage, um, economically in particular, and uh, corporations that have uh, uh, hundreds, maybe even thousands of legacy contracts that have arbitration provisions in them and haven't or have been frustrated in trying to find a way to realize an economy and an expedition in the context of arbitration. Um, talk a little bit about uh, whether or not uh, in the broadest possible sense, activities like the Uniform Mediation Act and anything else that might up the confidence of parties around the world in doing business in Atlanta uh, might in effect uh, address the concerns about the expense associated with arbitration? Well, one thing we hear from some of our Atlanta-based clients is, well, and you hear this from everybody, is we, we prefer to resolve the dispute in our home forum if we can. And if you are a Fortune 500 company based in Atlanta and you got the leverage to do so, uh, they're going to want to put in a, a forum selection clause that says we'll resolve this in the Northern District of Georgia or in the in business court. And that's the, the initial position. And a lot of times you, you just can't get that. And that's how you end up with the arbitration agreement. And, and if you are thoughtful when you're putting in the arbitration agreement, you think about the rules that you want to govern the arbitration, then you can make the process cheaper. You can go with expedited rules or you can pick an arbitral institution that will limit the amount of discovery. You can select an arbitrator who you know is going to be able to resolve your dispute within a set time period. And there are things that you can do when once you're in the arbitration process to also ensure that it is a speedy process and is not going to run up your bills. Another thing that you can do, and we tell our companies this all the time, is if you get that uh, an arbitration agreement and you're in a dispute, you don't like what the arbitration agreement says, the other side might not like it either. So there's an, always an opportunity to enter into a post-dispute arbitration agreement and m either fix a paradoxical arbitration agreement where it's unclear where you're going to resolve the dispute in the first place or move it to an uh, institution that you're comfortable with where you're, uh, you think you can control the cost. And that's something that we always take a look at. Shelby, thanks so much for being with us today. I hope maybe you can join us again. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Steve. You've been listening to The Future of Resolution, the podcast. You can follow The Future of Resolution on Miles Mediation and Arbitration's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Spotify, and subscribe, rate, or review this podcast. Join us soon for another interesting discussion. Thank you for listening.